if there's no evidence for it, I'm done with it. So I was challenged by folks like Dawkins to look for evidence. How did you then transition, though, when you ultimately found Jesus? One, I want to ask you how that happened. How did you end up finding Christ? But then how did you change your understanding of faith then uh, when that happened? Well, I think there's an extent to which you might be able to blame YouTube because um, I was, I mean, you know, when you're a student, it's very, it's very tempting just to, you know, watch things online and put off doing your essays. Um, So I I was watching clips of Dawkins on YouTube and debates. I was discovering these things and I I saw footage of, you know, people um, debating Dawkins and doing really badly and, you know, atheists and Christians and the Christians doing badly. But then I discovered actually really good, solid um, evidences and arguments for Christianity that the technical term is Christian apologetics. Um, it's not a very good word because it makes you sound like they're going around saying sorry for everything, <laughs> but that's not actually what it means. Um, it, it comes from the Greek word apologia, uh, which means to give a reasoned defense. So it's actually going out there and actually articulating and giving reasons and evidence um, for why a particular view is true and rational to believe. And so I discovered Christians who were doing that and they were engaging with the works of Richard Dawkins and other atheists. Um, And the one that stood out, I think, the most was William Lane Craig, um, who runs a ministry called Reasonable Faith. Um, there was lots of footage of William Lane Craig um, doing debates and lectures on YouTube, and he would be debating atheists, and actually the atheists would really struggle against him. And he would um, present lots of really compelling arguments, um, which included appealing to scientific data as well, Um, arguments for why the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe actually supports the existence of God, because it supports the the fact that if the universe had a beginning, then it had to have a transcendent cause. And then the nature of that cause would have to be very much like God, because you're ruling out, you're ruling out the material causes and so forth. Um, There were arguments for the fine tuning of the universe, for how the universe Mm. is so delicately set up to allow life to flourish. Um, There was the question of how can there be objective moral facts Um, if atheism is true. And specifically, um, when it came to Christianity, he was offering historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, saying, actually, you know what, if you just take the Bible's um, New Testament as just, just, just take it as a set of historical documents and subject it to normal historical critical scholarship, you actually end up with some facts in there about the life and death of Jesus, which are actually very, very strongly attested. Hmm. And the best explanation for those facts is actually that Jesus rose from the dead. So it was a cumulative case of um, all these arguments that he would be able to articulate very clearly and logically for Christianity. Because the irony actually was that even though Dawkins and the New Atheists, they would give lip service a lot to you know, you need to be logical, you need to be rational and and use reason. And that's true. You do. Of course you need to. You need to use your mind and you need to be challenged and you need to think. But the problem is that even though Dawkins and other new atheists were talking about we are being rational, we are arguing in a rational, logical way, actually, when you actually examine their arguments using logic, using analytic philosophy and logic like William Lane Craig was doing, because he's a professional philosopher who's trained in how to use logical argumentation, you actually discover that their arguments are very, very weak. Dawkins' mm-hmm. central argument against God in the in the God delusion has lots and lots of problems with it and, and assumptions and circular assumptions. You actually mentioned, I think, um, when uh, when you did that episode about the op-ed piece that I did, you said that Dawkins actually might be having some materialist presuppositions there. Mm. And it's true, he's assuming materialism right from the beginning. But on the logic front, this is something that William Lane Craig and others have pointed out. Even if you were to grant that every single step of Dawkins' main argument against God were true, the conclusion that God almost certainly doesn't exist still wouldn't follow from those steps in the argument. So this was what was really interesting. When I actually had the opportunity to learn how logic and argumentation and historical scholarship and all those things actually worked, 
it turned out that a lot of the the lip service that the new atheists were giving to evidence and logical argumentation really was just lip service. And there were some very strong arguments from the Christian worldview. Having the sort of academic um, questions very well addressed for Christianity meant that the more personal reservations I had were more exposed. Um, and I really just had to had to confront those. And I just realized, look, my allegiances have shifted here. Um, you know, I'm actually supporting apologists like William Lane Craig, and I'm no longer siding with these new atheists. Um, and the tipping point really was actually when William Lane Craig came to the UK to do a speaking and debating tour, um, which included going to Oxford and doing a lecture refuting the God delusion. Um, you know, I, I was able to meet him and have some really good discussions with him, mm. um, but also his wife, Jan, as well. Um, and she just said very clearly to me, look, Pete, it's great that you have come to this point of, you know, you say that you're no longer an atheist and that you've really engaged with, you know, all these good reasons for Christianity. But really, the key thing is it is about Jesus. And if you're not prepared to give him everything, then you sh actually shouldn't become a Christian. Don't do it. Because mm. actually, that is what it's about. You've got to go all in and give everything to him. And that really just made me realize what the decision had to be. Um, you know, um, it would be better off almost if I'd become an atheist, if, I, if I'd stayed an atheist and, and hadn't, um, you know, if I really felt I couldn't do that. It, it, it has to be that commitment and saying, you know, look, yes, you know, you, you exist, it's true. And that, you know, you're not a, um, a celestial, you know, tyrant like Christopher Hitchens would have um, described it. But actually, this is the loving God who created the entire universe and humanity, reaching out to say, I have a rescue plan for the mess that you've made of everything, and the mm. pressure that you put yourselves under, trying to you know, sort of basically save yourself, you know, um, and, and, you know, be this person trying to exist without me. I've got a redemption plan. You can just take it up, take what Jesus did on the cross. And there are good reasons for that being historically true, by the way, you know, because mm -hmm. of the apologetics. So really, that it was that combination, really, the, the apologetics helped me deal with those questions which then allowed the more emotional personal exploration to happen um, to uh, bring into that conversion.